Good evening, everyone. Welcome to, to tonight's uh, annual public forum sponsored by the Center for Forensic Behavioral Science and Justice Studies here at the University of Saskatchewan. I'm Steve Wormuth. I'm the director of the Forensic Center, and I'm particularly you know, pleased you know, to introduce you uh, to a group of speakers this evening who will be talking about you know, the restorative action program here in Saskatoon. I'd like to acknowledge that, uh, of course, we're on you know, Treaty 6 territory and home of the uh, Métis peoples. Um, I'd also like to say a little bit about um, you know, the, the RAP, as it's known, you know, momentarily. I um, should also you know, advise you that um, this is uh, apparently a uh, no food and drink uh, room on this particular occasion. So um, cheers. <laughs> this is an annual you know, kind of thing that we have to do. Um, I'll only say, yeah, please be sure to remove all the evidence you know, at the end of the evening, and they'll let us come back next year. <clears throat> About tonight's program, the Restorative Action Program is a 15-year-old community-based restorative justice initiative. It is hosted in high schools and sustained you know, through the shared responsibility of multiple human partners, other supportive organizations, and citizens. Tonight, we will hear about the research and findings of a seven-year you know, project you know, related to you know, the RAP program. Now, we're particularly uh, interested and happy to you know, present this evening's you know, forum because, in fact, the, the Forensic Center has been uh, quite closely involved I mean, with RAP personnel um, and its sponsors I mean, for um, many of those years now. Um, it's also a tip of the hat to you know, Saskatoon I mean, Rotary and Club, um, who I can't say enough about in terms of their human sponsorship you know, the volunteer work that its members have put into you know, this concept going back I mean, a, a decade and a half ago and really you know, shown the fruits of you know, their investment uh, over the years. And we're seeing you know, those fruits I mean, more and more uh, as, as time you know, progresses. We have a number of speakers this evening. And you know, they'll be given a, a brief period of time um, you know, to talk a little bit about their uh, participation and involvement you know, from the different perspectives you know, that they offer. What I'll do is introduce each speaker you know, who will take the podium and speak and then introduce you know, the subsequent speakers. Um, so at any given time, you know who's, who's up next and you don't have to recall you know, the, the list of folks that I've described a minute at the outset. Winston Blake, so welcome to join us you know, now, uh, is Restorative Action Program's Executive Director. He holds an advanced Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Saskatchewan in 1995 and a Master's in Conflict Analysis and Management from Royal Roads University in 2015. In addition to his Master's, Winston has also a Certificate in Conflict Management from the Alberta Arbitration um, and Mediation Society, and is a chartered member with the Alternative Dispute Resolution Institute of Canada. So we're particularly delighted to have Winston here to kick things off. He, in fact, is the um, a major force I mean, behind you know, the RAP program. Winston? Thank you very much. I want to begin this evening's uh, event by sharing you, with you a little bit of information that I myself learned many, many years ago. You may be surprised to know that despite their reputation as fearsome warriors, the Maasai, when they meet each other on the plains of Africa, give a simple greeting between each warrior. And that greeting is simply Kassiarian in Gara. Now, when translated from Swahili into English, this traditional greeting means, how are the children? The greeting acknowledges the high value that the Maasai place upon the well-being of their children. Even warriors with no children of their own will always give the traditional response, which is sapati ingeta, which means all the children are well. See, if a warrior greeted another warrior and upon giving the traditional greeting, heard the other warrior say, the children are not well, that warrior was duty bound, as a matter of fact, honor bound to stop his own journey and ask, 
what can I do to help? In 2001, Mount Royal Ecclesia was facing many challenges that was not just unique to this school community, but it was a population that was struggling with issues like addictions, bullying, conflict, crime, academic failure, poverty, the list goes on. There was an issue that they, in the school community, seemed that was also spilling over into the larger community. And the community demanded solutions. The school in this moment of challenge really made a very powerful choice. They decided to go out into the community and they decided to ask the community for help. Instead of doing the same things that would be done by schools, like suspending students by withdrawing them, they said, you know, we need to invest the community in order to find solutions to our problem. Everywhere they went, they received the same response, which was, we pay our taxes. We contribute enough to education, don't we? If you really want to solve the problem, just call the police. It was not the right answer. It was not until the leadership of the school community came across a number of Rotarians led by Peter Whiteneck at the time, that, who had a long history of serving the community and more importantly, meeting the community's needs, that the school found a partner. And in 2001, these Rotarians, like the Messiah themselves, when they heard the response of the school community that talked about the challenges facing the young people, asked in their way, what can we do to help? You see, Rotary recognized that the school was doing as much as they could do. But it was not the sole responsibility of the school to do everything. The lives of children also was a part of the school and a part of the community. They leveled your personal contacts and their personal information, and they brought together a number of partners. And in 2003, the Restorative Justice Project for a three-year commitment was born. In those days, RAP focused primarily on restorative justice practices to deal with a portion of the school population, those deemed to be most at risk. There was success in those early days. There was the opportunity to see a new pathway forward. In 2007, I had the great fortune of being hired by the Restorative Action Program to cover off a mat leave. As part of my agreement with the school community, I said that I would want to, to test the framework that I had been working on for many years when I lived in Alberta. And the framework primarily focused upon teaching kids core skills that they could use to prevent an escalation of their issues and their conflict. Also providing them with appropriate interventions, like mediation and other justice practices, and more importantly, giving them the opportunity to reconnect with relationships that they were often disconnected from in their lives. The PIR model basically focused upon the idea of building resiliency within young people, but not just within the youth themselves, but also primarily within the entire school community. I was given a room at the school, a safe and welcoming place where students could come, be able to have the opportunity to talk, even to hang out if they needed to. The framework that was provided, first and foremost, under prevention, was really about going into the classrooms, providing opportunities to, to teach kids about skills that they may not have had, like conflict management, about healthy relationships. And more importantly, we had the opportunity, because we're in a school community, to do projects to do a lot of different projects that would engage students in different ways. One of the very first projects that I offered to our school community was the CFL. I remember announcing at the break to all the students in the school, come to my room for the CFL. Students were approaching me in the hallway because as you know, in Saskatchewan, football is not just a sport, it's almost a religion. So kids were excited to have the CFL come to Bedford Road. Who's gonna come from the Rough Riders? I cannot wait. The day came and the students arrived in my room, wide-eyed and excited and enthusiastic. I said, welcome everyone. Welcome to the very first Chick Flick lunch hour. What? Yes, we're going to have an opportunity to talk about relationships, to be able to watch films about relationships, to be able to talk about healthy as well as unhealthy relationships. I remember as the year went on, I would find that students would often come to me after a CFL lunch hour and say, you know, Winston, that video we watched last weekend, last week in our classroom here, and about those two couples that were having a problem, they were kind of fighting, they were kind of getting a divorce. That's happening right now in my life. 
Can I talk about that? See, this was an opportunity to raise issues in a way that was non-threatening, but more importantly, comforting to the students there. I remember a young man at the end of the school year, I approached him and said, you know, hey, you've been here for every single CFL. You must really love chick flicks. He said, Winston, you know, it's simple. It's about 12 guys in the room usually, 25 to 30 girls. I'm good at math. <laughs> One of my colleagues said these words, boys are taught when the fight is over. Girls are never taught that the fight should be over. If you know what I'm talking about, say yes. If you know what I'm talking about, say yes. If you know what I'm talking about, say yes. You see, another project that we focused on was also helping young girls to overcome the challenges they were facing in their peer relationships. Helping them to kind of break the cycle of all of the negative conflict that they were experiencing, the relational aggression between them and their peers. I remember going out into school and, and surveying a number of the girls in the school and, and finding out who were the drama queens and who were the victims of drama. And then we gave this list to the administration and said, we want to break it down to about 25 girls at the most, if possible. I remember one of the administrators looking at me and saying, you know, Winston, there's a name on this list, young girl. I'm not sure why she's on this list. I said, oh, she's a fire starter. She's what? Well, she's a young girl that likes to spread a little gossip and little rumors amongst her friends. And then she kind of stands back and watches it all burn. So we had these young girls now come into the room. And the very first day, I remember the, the glare is across the table, the sense of, of tension in the room. You could cut it with a knife. But those young girls, first day, second day, third day, start to kind of break through some of the things that they were experiencing in their lives. And I remember we were about halfway through the program, and the young girls were doing an activity called I Am, where they were asked to write down in their journals all of the positive things about who they were, all the good things about what they had in their lives. And they started to write these lists. And then I said, you know, girls, this is wonderful. I want you now to share your lists amongst each other. And so one young girl volunteered to read her lists. And she said all of the good things about herself. Things like, I am tall. I am an, an athlete. I am funny. I, I'm a good person. I'm kind. I'm happy. And all these young girls shared their lists with each other. And then at the end of the activity, I said, you know, girls, you've done a great thing. You've shared with each other the great things about who you are, but you've missed the most important person in this room. Who's that? And I had a mirror in my room. And I gathered these girls around that mirror in a half circle, and I said, now I want you each to take your list and read that list into that mirror and tell the most important person in your life who you are. And one by one, these young women read, read their lists. I am beautiful. I am special. I am worthy. No matter how long it goes and how many years pass from that moment, that moment still impacts me. You see, these young girls had understood something that they had maybe forgotten in their lives, but how they're worthy of acceptance, of love, and of respect. And the sisterhood that they shared one another that day was incredible. One day I got a call from the local paper who said to me, you know, Winston, we want to come out and interview these young girls. We want, to, we want to tell their story because what they've done is so incredible. They're not just keeping these skills that they've learned to each themselves, but they're sharing with other people in the community, other people in their school. And these young girls were honored that day. And as the caption says here, it's not just about themselves, but it's about respecting. Respecting themselves, respecting others in their lives. One day I was in my room and I had a young girl who came into the program and approach me and say, Winston, I have a big problem. I said, what, what, what's the problem? She walked in and said, I, I, I would like to have a boyfriend. I looked at her and I said, that is not my job. And she said, no, I'm not, I'm not asking you to find me a boyfriend. I'm just asking you to un let me understand what's going on with the boys in our school. She said, you know, I have changed. I have grown. I'm a, I'm a better person today. And I look at all the guys in my school, and I'm thinking to myself, none of them are worthy of me. She said, well, if you could just teach them to be better men, if you could just teach them what you've taught us, then maybe one of them might be worthy of me. After she explained to me the kind of actions and activities that young boys do, it struck upon me to kind of 
do something to help the young boys in our school community. You see, I always say that the world does not need more men. What the world needs is better men. If you know what I'm talking about, say yeah. If you know what I'm talking about, say yeah. If you know what I'm talking about, say yeah. yeah. You see, so often young boys are disconnected with their emotional selves. They have maybe men in their lives who are not active male role models. And here was an opportunity to help these young men to learn about themselves, to become emotionally intelligent, and to be able to have the opportunity to be provided the chance to succeed. The framework focused on providing restorative justice, things like mediation and other restorative justice practices. We provided an opportunity for young people to take ownership of what they were doing in their lives so that they could change, learn, and grow. And we also, in the framework, provided the reconnections that would help young people to make sure that they have a place in their lives. We supported them just to, to, to re-engage with important relationships, either peer, parental, or societal. And by 2009, the framework was solidly entrenched in all of our RAP schools at that time. In 2011, the Rotarians recognized that the mom and pop operation at that time had far outgrown its usefulness. And there was a, a larger sophistication and complexity of the program that required us to, to do things to manage the program in a more important way. So the restorative action program, the new restorative action program, for lack of a better word, was, was born. And today, we are available and accessible to 8,000 youth across nine high schools in our city, four of them in the public school system, and five of them in the Catholic school system. And I want to tell you about our RAP facilitators. I want to tell you about the people that drive this program every single day, our wonderful, incredible RAP facilitators. These are highly trained, skilled individuals who help to build an environment of trust so youth are comfortable in accessing the program. One student is quoted as saying, I went to see the rap worker in the first place because of my situation. I was dealing with a lot of stuff at home, so I went to her just to talk about what was going on in my house and for the extra support. The rap facilitators help to build a strong foundation of assets for young people so that they have hope in their lives. They give tools to the toolboxes that are often sometimes empty. One student is quoted as saying, having the rap worker there you know is going to her for support, just for anything or just to talk to. She really pushed me and she's really supportive. Through our prevention, intervention and reconnection framework, students learn and they have the opportunity to engage in numerous prevention activities. We've conducted opportunities to bring in the community, like for example, the South Student Council on Aging has done a number of projects with us in our schools to help to bridge the intergenerational gap between young and old. We've had the opportunity to, to, to engage our school partners and things like the Focus on the Family at ADF, and where the whole school community goes out and commits to act of services, of service above self in that day. This magical day is an incredible thing to see. Our RAP supporters help to actually build a bridge between the school and the community, engaging the larger community in projects like the, the Dan Warden Revitalization Project and helping young people to actually learn that they have a responsibility and an ownership to our community. They brought together students from across our city to engage with one another. They helped students to, to be empowered as agents of change. They help to raise the awareness of important issues affecting young people like mental health and addictions. They've conducted presentations to parents and to teens and to school staff on digital citizenship, helping to create a safer digital footprint for young people. And our staff promote the values of a safe, caring, and respectful school. They work with grade eight students to prepare them for entry into grade nine to ensure that they actually have a place in their school community. One student in Dakota is saying, the most important experience I had was probably going out with the rap worker and going to schools and helping prepare some grade eight students for transition into high school. I didn't have somebody in high school come to talk to me when I was in grade eight. As you can see, our staff conducted 353 prevention activities last year alone. 353 activities to help to build the capacity of the school community. 
our interventions are foundational to our work. We help students when they need it the most. We are there to conduct one-on-one -on -one presentations and, and discussions and consultations, helping students actually move past those issues that keep them stuck sometimes in, in school. As one student said, when I have an issue with my teacher or with other classmates, there's an option that he does, and that's to use mediation, and he makes it a safe place to work out our issues. The benefits of this incredible program are not just based upon what happens in the school, but as we can see here, the majority of our engagement is student-driven. 33% of our referrals are self-initiated by students, and 10% of our referrals are peer initiated. In other words, these are people, young people, bringing in their friends to say, I can't help you, but I know someone in the school who can help you. This is an important metric of success. Being someone that trusts, being someone that's competent, being someone that's capable, able to do what needs to be done to help students when they need it the most. It is stated that our mediations in our schools, the majority of them, 29%, are initiated by the students themselves. In other words, the students have a culture within their school that says, we want to be able to deal with our issues as opposed to using violence as a solution. According to one aspect of collected data, 15%, 50% of our mediations are a blatant success. And as we know, any good intention program any good intention idea cannot be successful without good follow-up. As the vice principal said, as the vice principal, you take care of all the conflict and work with students to figure out what the intervention is going to be. But having a rap worker there so they can focus on the follow-up, it's hard to do that follow-up as a vice principal. I want to make it clear that we are in so many ways providing another layer of support. We work in conjunction with the entire school community so that there is an opportunity to interlace and inter interconnect with student services, admin teams, social workers in the community. And we work collaboratively with our community partners every single day to ensure that what we are doing is impactful and is successful. Last year alone, we had 1,385 students use our, our interventions. That is a large number of students who need support. Our reconnections our way of ensuring that in so many ways, discipline does not become the only solution in the kids' lives. RAP contributes to helping kids stay in school, helping them stay in school so they can graduate, so they can actually have the opportunity to succeed in their lives. But none of this could be pop possible without the support of the community, led by the Rotarians, led by our ministries of justice and education, supported by our numerous friends of RAP, supporters of RAP, benefactors of RAP. This is the greatest example, I believe, of how this community and how schools can work together for a common cause to benefit our youth. Our next presenter, uh, joining us on the podium here, uh, I'm particularly you know, delighted to introduce you to uh, Carolyn Kamen. Uh, she currently works out of Vancouver, British Columbia, as an independent evaluation consultant and is formerly a research officer with the Center for Forensic Behavioral Science and Justice Studies, um, and in fact was a uh, graduate student in the MA program here in Applied Social Psychology at the University of Saskatchewan. So uh, Carolyn has a long you know, connection with us, and uh, I dare say that our involvement, you know, um, between U of S and the Forensic Center, particularly, and you know, Winston and his colleagues at RAP, really uh, had this, their genesis. Uh, Carolyn's work uh, as a practicum student, uh, first uh, uh, crossing the doors of the, the RAP folks in Rotary and has been able to stay with us and with RAP and with Winston and Rotary on an ongoing basis, even from afar, 
as you know, she has been um, working with the evaluation aspect of you know, the, the RAP program. As she gets set up, and I think she is, I'll turn things over to Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Am I live? There we go. There's the voice. Uh, I will issue one, one slight correction, just because this is for public record, but I do use they, them pronouns. So, just so everybody knows. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this panel tonight, and I'll probably move around a little bit because I don't like to stand still, um, but I'll bring you with me. So I've been asked to talk about the evaluation of the restorative action program, in particular, the, what I'm calling the early years. Uh, this has been a pretty long project, um, and in fact, so let's see, so this is 2018, and I currently work in uh, Vancouver, BC as uh, an independent evaluation consultant, but eight, and a two, eight years and two months ago, I arrived here from Ontario uh, to begin my graduate studies at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, at, in our Applied Social Psychology program. And I actually arrived here, so this is the Center for Forensic Behavioral Science and Justice Studies. When I got here in 2010, it was the Forensic Behavioral Science and Justice Studies Initiative. I was here pre-center um, when it was still an initiative. And part of the ASP master's program is to do some practical learning in the community, um, working with community organizations to provide applied research support, usually but not always in the form of evaluation, um, to make sure that these are resources that are accessible uh, to organizations that wouldn't normally get to do that kind of research, uh, and to give some experiential learning to students. And so when the spring of 2011 came around, I was getting ready for my summer internship, my first placement, and I had a couple of options, but one of them was this group of people who had approached us, um, I think that winter, saying, hey, we've got this program, we've been working on it for a few years, we have a sense that it's, that it's working, that it's doing something. Something great is happening here. We really feel strongly about that. Um, but we want help showing what we're doing and, and really learning about what we're doing. And they came to us with this burning question of, are we making a difference? Is it working? And it would be years, you know, I had to be working as a professional evaluator before I came to understand just how special that was as an experience. Um, that you know, often when you work with an organization that, that's being evaluated, it's because they're, they're ticking off, you know, oh, we promised the funder that we would do this, and there's kind of an apathy around it, or, oh, wow, if we don't get an evaluation done in the next three months, they're gonna pull our funding completely, and there's a stress and an anxiety about it. But this was a group of people who just had a burning passion and desire to learn about what was happening and use that knowledge for the better because they believe so strongly in their program. I think you saw that um, in the presentation that Winston just gave, that there's a lot of uh, passion and caring in this, and that's why they came for evaluation. It was the strong internal motivation. And so one of my first jobs as a student was to come up with some kind of project that I could do over a three-month internship that would help them, that would be feasible for me. And I thought, okay, well, you know, they haven't done evaluation before. Um, they're not necessarily set up to be evaluated yet. I should start with an as evaluability assessment, which is a kind of term that evaluators have come up with, precisely because most programs don't have evaluation built into it from the beginning. And when you get in there, you don't know do you have goals that you have framed in a way that we can like, measure them? What kind of data do you have accessible? Is, is there any data that you've collected already? You know, is there a shared vision of the program? Do people agree on what the program is supposed to be? And so that evaluability assessment is really just getting in there and finding out how could we evaluate this? Uh, and this is the email I got from Steve back uh, on my one-page brief uh, that I sent. It was just an outline of the project. So, uh, this is very good, thanks, Steve. Please bring to meeting. However, we must be cautious. They may want to spring into action and think that this is an unnecessary delay, so we will tread lightly and feel them out first. So this is before we sat down with them. <laughs> he didn't know I was gonna do that. Uh, I think we sat down with him like the next week or something like that. I mean, he's right. He's absolutely right. Again, this is a group of people that came to us with this burning question. Are we making a difference? And I'm saying, well, hold on. 
you know, let's do a program logic model first. Let's talk about your goals first. Like, you know, we're not saying we're going to answer the question, are you making a difference? And that's the one you really want to know. But bless them. Uh, because, I, and there may have been some grumbling behind the scenes, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame them if there was some consternation around, like, but we, we want to get to this question. Um, but really, I mean, when it comes to evaluation, and we know this now, the, the question is not what works. It's often, well, what do we mean by what works? You know, what works when and for whom and under what conditions and why and how and what are the mechanisms and, and contributing to all of this? And when we say what works, what do we really mean by that? And particularly in the case of RAP, which is actually quite a complex program, they're trying to uh, affect change in how students relate to each other, think about themselves, interact with the, each other and their school environments, change school environments, change community environments. They're it's a really big question. It takes a lot of evaluation. And frankly, very few organizations of RAP's size are ever able to access evaluation the way that we've done it. And I didn't know this at the time. Again, I had to actually be out working in the field for a while before I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> we actually have done something really cool here. Um, and we did it in uh, a stepwise way. We did it in sort of, you know, one thing at a time. Every time we did a project with RAP, it was, what can we give you right now that's going to help you, that's going to get you to the next step, that's going to answer some of your questions and probably raise like 16 more, <laughs> um, but that will create a foundation for further work. And that's what we've spent the last seven years doing. And it started with that evaluability assessment. And, and some of the things that one of the things that came out of that evaluability assessment, this is a museum piece. This is the very first program logic model of RAP. Don't get too attached to it. It changes. Um, but this was our first attempt to try to say, OK, when we talk about RAP and all the different things that go into RAP and all the experimentation that goes into RAP, because what happens at one school might be a little different than what happens at another school. There might be new opportunities and ideas that are coming up. But when we talk about the backbone of what is RAP, the essence of it, what is it supposed to be? What goes into it? What do the RAP staff do? What do we expect to see happen for the students who participate in it? What do we expect those changes to bring about uh, in their lives, in their schools, in their communities? So this was our first attempt to try to um, figure that out. And, and there were about, I think, 28 recommendations that went along with this, which is too many. I know that now. Um, but, and a lot of them were things like, hey, when you talk about leadership, we need to, you to define what you mean by leadership. When you talk about healthy relationships, we need to figure out, well, what does a healthy relationship look like and how will we know it when we see it? Because how else are we going to try to measure it and find out if it's happening? Um, and then the other set of, big set of recommendations were around things like, can we get data on this and how? <laughs> In fact, one of the very th first things that we uh, realized when we were looking at RAP is um, the need f to take the program itself and find out more clearly what was happening. What were the RAP workers doing? How many students were they seeing? What services were they delivering to those students? Every, every site, every RAP worker was measuring that a little bit differently. We could take that system, we could strengthen it, we could standardize it, and we could give them a really strong base of their own program data which became our first project coming out of that evaluability assessment. And we developed a database that has been running for like, I think, yeah, we, the first year we had it out was 2013. It has just recently been upgraded uh, into an exciting new form that you'll hear about shortly. Um, but for five years, we collected um, just essential program statistics. You know, how many students are coming in? What are the characteristics of those students? What kinds of services are they receiving? Um, this is just a screenshot of what that database looked like for about five years, so that the RAP workers were able to, like, you know, put in students, see what kinds of services, you know, the one-on-one -on -one support or the mediations that they'd been involved in, the different activities that were happening in the schools and so forth. Um, screenshot of one of the forms, that, you know. Uh, the, and we created this system very much in cooperation with the RAP staff themselves. Um, we looked at what they were already doing. We built a system that was mirroring that so that it would fit into their existing workflow. And we got lots of feedback. The first two years, there were some major uh, overhauls and changes to the database to make sure it was something that they could use. Um, 
because, and this is something else that I, it took me years to appreciate, is how big an ask it is when you have people whose primary job is to support students who might at any point come to their office in crisis or even just come to their office and want to sit down and chat because their primary job in that building is to have relationships with students. That will always be their primary responsibility. Entering stats is never going to be their primary responsibility. So to have frontline staff who are in that situation also consistently and, and accurately entering their data, um, and, and it depends on You can build the nicest database we want, and if the, if the workers don't put the numbers in correctly, that's what we're getting out at the end. Uh, the RAP staff have been incredibly engaged. They've absolutely bought into the process. They know that the data is important, even when it's a pain in the ass to do it. They know that it reflects the work that they do. They know that, that it's going to be used to support the program. And that level of, of buy-in has actually been pretty incredible. Um, so we put that in place early on. Uh, this, this whole experience has kind of been an exercise in delayed gratification, I think, uh, for RAP, because the very next big thing that we took on was not an outcome evaluation, it was a literature review. Yep, three, you know, three major phases in, and we were saying, oh, you know what, it's time to look at what everyone else is doing, not, not a, your own success. We need to look at what everyone else is doing. But it was really important. At this stage, we, we didn't know where RAP fit into the big picture of things. Uh, we didn't know... You know, who else is out there? What are they doing? What lessons can we learn from what they're doing? What's not in the literature? What's missing? Where could RAP make a contribution? You know, in what ways is RAP similar and RAP different from other things out there? We looked at what are the frameworks that could inform what we can do? How are those programs being evaluated? Are there methods that we can apply to what we're doing? Uh, so I produced a one, literally 100-page document of a literature review, and I know that it was thoroughly read because I had board members very gently and kindly letting me know about the typos on page 32 and 67 and 91. They read every page. Um, and I still go back to that literature review. It has been a very useful resource document. I see it turn up in places. We learn quite a lot. I won't go over the whole thing. It is up on the RAP website if you're interested in 100 pages about uh, RAP-related research. Um, we looked at some of the other programs that are out there, uh, how they differed, how they were similar, what lessons we might take from them. Um, we looked at some of the frameworks. We found you know, positive youth development and restorative practices in particular uh, really reflected a lot of what RAP was about. Um, I, we looked at some of the methods that were used to evaluate these other kinds of programs and found that there wasn't a single gold standard way to do it. Uh, there was lots of different things that have been tried, and most of them involved multiple methods, multiple indicators, and, and looking at multiple outcomes, usually over multiple projects. So we were right on track at that point. Finally, in 2016, so a full five years after they came to us with the question, are we making a difference? We began a very consciously named phase one outcome evaluation. This was not the be all and end all of now we know, now we know for sure, because as I said, this is a complex program. There is no now we know for sure. But this was about starting to look at, okay, what changes are happening, and, and to what extent can they be linked with what RAP is doing. And we took a success case method to start. This is a qualitative case study approach, uh, very similar to what's been used in the literature as well, uh, where we wanted to talk to, rather than try to get at the average experience, the success case method looks at the exceptional experiences, the successes, and technically you can also look at, at the extreme negative cases. We weren't able to in, in this particular instance. But the idea is to look at, okay, when the program is working at its absolute best, first of all, can we find any instances of that? Because if you can't find those, that tells you something about your program. But when you can find those cases, what does it look like when it's working? Does it look like the theory that you have about why it should be working? Does it resemble what you're expecting to see, or is it something completely different? Um, so you talk to, we talked to students, we talked to teachers, we also did as much verification as we could with the RAP staff. We kept uh, collecting detailed stories through interviews, finding out about people's experiences and looking into, um, you know, when RAP works really well, what does it look like? 
What can we learn from that? And is there anything about that that's generalizable to the potentially average experience? And I, there's a whole report on this. Again, it's up on the website. I won't go over every kind of finding from it. There was lots of interesting things. But we did, in talking with people, find evidence to support the emerging program theory that we talked about based on that logic model that I showed you earlier. Um, so things like, hey, we have examples of students who are learning new skills and things like communication and conflict resolution, who are developing a positive sense of self and other positive attributes. So I, love it. I learned that people actually love me. It taught me that my story is important and that my voice is important. It taught me that I belong. You know? And we saw that connect to instances of reduced and avoided conflict. Students saying, yeah, there was a time where I was able to take those skills and, and that sense of self that I developed and, and a, you know, manage my conflicts more effectively. We heard people tell us stories of, of persevering in school, sticking around in school um, due to the support of their RAP worker. And when we asked about, okay, well, what was it about that that was helpful for you? What, what were the, some of the mechanisms here that contributed to that experience? A couple of the big ones that came out. So a safe and accessible environment, very similar to what Winston mentioned. So it's a really open environment. You just feel completely comfortable. You don't feel like you're looked down on when you're dealing with whatever someone's dealing with. You know, he makes it a safe place, he in this case being the RAP uh, facilitator, makes it a safe place to talk about things. That's what I like most about it, that it's open. And then the RAP facilitators themselves, a huge piece of the puzzle. He doesn't get mad, like at all. He sits there and he listens, and that's why it works, I think, because he listens. She was so easy to talk to and so genuine. She was very understanding. So we're hearing it's this relationship with the RAP worker that's so core. So that was our outcome evaluation. And where we're at now, we're continuing our monitoring. As I said, you're going to hear a little bit more about some of the more recent projects that are coming up. Um, but I just want to, so this is, this is actually from our most recent uh, program data report. It's actually not completely finalized yet. Um, and what the, that particular figure is showing is that incidents of uh, bullying uh, involve, so one-on-one -on -one cases or mediations that involve bullying over the last four years have been decreasing. Now, the, the challenge with the program monitoring data is it tells us what happens. We look at the trends, we see, okay, what's changing over year, what's changing school to school. It does not tell us why any of that is happening. As I said, I'm doing a much better job at creating questions than I am at answering them sometimes. But if you're wondering about what all this yellow is, that's Winston. This is, this is the copy that Winston, so I sent him a draft of the report. He sent it, uh, a copy back, uh, I think a couple weeks later, and it was just every page looked like this. Yellow highlighting, comments. This, this, sorry, this is evaluation utilization in action. This is someone who, he tells me, and I believe him, that he waits for these reports like it's Christmas coming. Um, and yeah, so this whole report, it's full of, the occasional typo mention, um, but it's quite, so as I said, I'm say, here's what's happening in your data. This is what it looks like. This number's going up, this number's going down. These numbers have stayed the same. You know, these, this is happening at these schools, this is happening at these schools. And as I said, it's creating all these questions. And, and Winston is asking these questions, you know, why is this occurring? Are, like, this is that, that same question that they came to us in 2011, still asking, we're getting closer to answering it. But to me, this is the most important part. As an evaluator, this is what I want to see. I want people to be using data, not just to say, OK, done. Now we know everything we need to know about our program. It's you know, completely, let's put that away now. No, that there's always going to be new questions going out, that this is about a journey of learning, um, that as long as this program is sort of thriving and dynamic and, and adapting to these complex environments, that there's going to be a need to look at what's happening and what can we learn from it? What does this mean? And it's that spirit of learning and inquisitiveness and curiosity and that passion to learn that makes it so exciting as an evaluator to work on this project. Uh, as we have for the last seven years and counting. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Carolyn. And our next speaker, we can move on. Cyril. Dr. Cyril Cooper uh, studied and taught computer science at the University of Saskatchewan 
and Computer Systems Technology at SIAST at the time. It's now Saskatchewan Polytechnic. He currently works at Saskatchewan Polytechnic as a as senior research associate. His areas of expertise include databases, programming, software engineering, and systems analysis and design. So we're particularly uh, delighted to have Dr. C uh, Cooper with us here, uh, carrying on you know, with the work that uh, Carolyn initiated some years ago and uh, you know, bring you up to date as to you know, where things are moving. Cyril. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here tonight uh, with people who have been with RAP for seven years and counting. I've been involved for about seven months so hasn't been near as long, uh, but we've done some exciting things, I think. And uh, the um, passion that is of obvious tonight and in, with the people that uh, I've met through the RAP program over seven months, it, it, it's infectious. And so it's uh, affected us as well and the team uh, as, as we've worked. We have a pretty big team. Uh, most uh, of the interaction I've had with the RAP people is with Winston and of course Carolyn. Um, I'm not the major worker on this project at SAS Poly. I'm more of the um, project manager and technical guide. We have students who work on it. These are, uh, in one case, one student was a graduate of the Computer Systems Technology Program at SAS Poly. And uh, the other, uh, he was in between his first and second year. And they worked through the summer uh, on funding that, uh, so that we could pay them to do the job. And they have done the actual development work that has got us to where we are now. I have done some work in developing the new uh, data storage, which is the exciting part. And uh, we'll be talking about that. I have a fellow researcher. Cal Beckler, who also works at uh, SAS Poly. And then our students, Rafael De Luna, Drayden Saki, Chris Ingen, and Jason Denis. Now, Jason uh, came from another project while that project was on hold and applied his uh, expertise with us. Uh, so we, we had some very strong uh, student involvement in what we've done so far. And we're still working, and there's lots, to, uh, lots more to do. So we hope to keep students involved in that as well. I think that's a pretty important aspect for a project such as this. Um, as uh, Carolyn mentioned, the background, nine schools, six years of data. This is what I was given when I first uh, came on board with the project. There were uh, these uh, different databases, each one independent of the other, containing similar, but not, not necessarily uh, the same data. In some cases, uh, different values were used or different terms were used and so on. Carolyn had done most of the uh, cleansing of the data so that she could put together the reports. And every year, the schools would start with a fresh blank slate and gather data for that year. So one of the things that we wanted to address uh, in terms of being able to determine the strength of the program, the strengths and where uh, things could be improved and, and that we are in fact having an effect was to put some sort of relationship into the data. The existing data from the past seven years, we can't, but moving forward, we can. And that is then just another way that we'll be able to then measure the changes that are taking place and where, where the, the changes are positive, or as Carolyn mentioned, uh, at the other end of the scale, we can look into the data and hopefully find what is driving these things. Where can we uh, address uh, issues and just make the program better? Um, so with that in mind, what we've done initially is redeveloped the front end, the client, the part that the actual facilitators work with. And we've done that in a way that means when the time comes and we're ready to do it, we can interface with our system using a computer, using a tablet, using a smartphone, basically any device that will support a web-style interface. And this is what a lot of people are familiar with now, with smartphones, uh, other Android devices, and I, I, uh, devices, iOS devices, and so on. Um, 
being able to do what you want to do when and where you are with whatever device you've got is an important thing. So that's part of what the students were doing uh, through the summer is investigating and then developing this sort of an interface so that we could actually run it on a smartphone or a, a laptop or a pad, a full desktop computer, whatever. We made some changes to the data that was collected in the forms that you saw uh, when Carolyn put them up. Uh, some of the things were checkboxes, yes, no, or uh, what I call binary. And in cases where uh, the, an incident was being described, there were things like bullying, yes, no, physical, yes, no, verbal, yes, no. But we all know that the, there's a range of the interaction. So yes, there might have been something verbal in the incident, but was it really a major thing or a minor thing, right? So we changed those binary values to uh, discrete values to try and see, is this something the facilitators find useful and does it tell us useful data? Uh, and then we redesigned the database. Uh, originally it was uh, a Microsoft Access database, which is what we call relational. And we've gone to uh, a new style of database called a graph database. So here's sort of the difference between the two. Up in the top left there, you see what is basically the familiar uh, row and column approach that uh, a relational database has and is very similar to Excel. So if you're used to a spreadsheet, then you would look at this and go, okay, yeah, I can see uh, rows and columns of data and it's all there. The data is very important, and this is what we've been capturing. But if you're also familiar with Excel, then you know that often you'll take your data and you'll select it and you'll push it into a graph or a chart so that you can visually see what this two-column data is telling you. And that's one of the things that relational databases don't do well. You can get this visual data out of it, but largely, even though relational databases use the word relational, it is not something that's easily brought out of the database and then uh, presented in a visual form. Now, the graph database, on the other hand, is built on that concept right from the get-go. So data are stored as little dots. As you can see there, we call them nodes. And the data that's stored there in that node, you can see on the right, of the graph database, it's all there. This, the, the data that was in the relational is, is there. But in addition to the data that's being stored, the relationships in the data itself becomes uh, visual. So when I look at a particular group of values in a relational database, I come up with this large statement to say, here's the data I want, to, I want to get, and what do I see when it presents itself to me? I see the rows and columns. Doing the same thing in the graph database, this is what I see. I see nodes joined together in particular ways. Those joins are relationships. And really that's what it's all about is the relationships between the students, the conflicts, the people that are involved. And this database ga ga captures that in its normal way. That's what a graph database is all about. So this is sort of the starting point of build, rebuilding the interface and then looking at the data and storing it in this new way. Now, could you have done this with a relational database? Certainly. The visualization could have been built on top of the database. But over on the left, I have a simple output. I've got this one and down at the bottom, you can see what they are. So here we have a, uh, a student, and then the student has involvement in two one-on-ones. The relationships are labeled, they can have data on it, like when it was, who, was, who it was, what was the outcome, and so on. But with a sing, sim, sing, uh, single click of the mouse, I can get what's on the right. It just takes me out, going, okay, from that one student and the two one-on-ones, what other relationships exist? And this is what we see. That one student, there's five different relationships there, and then peers out beyond. And notice we also have a relationship to another student. So we can look at one student and say, okay, go out 
one or two relationships, and lo and behold, there's another involvement, another student. We can look at that student and go out from there accordingly. So we have single student with multiple involvements. You can see up in the top. And this, by the way, is actual data from the 2017-2018 relational database that Carol gave me. Okay, so these, these graphs that you see. When you see the names and things on the relational database, that's Donald Duck and, and whatever. Those, those have been uh, uh, cooked. But this data that we're seeing here in, in its uh, anonymous form, that's actual data right out of the 2017-2018. So a single student at the center of a series of incidents. Here we've got student 1064 where purple is the student and red is the mediation. Notice that one student has had three mediations involving three other students, and two of those students have had further mediations with other students. So if you go up towards the left, you can see that that one student was involved with three mediations as well. Is that interesting? I think so. What does it mean? I have no idea. That it's in the data. I'm not the one that does. I'm a data person. I, I, go into the data, I pull this stuff out, and they say, okay, here, you decide what it means, I'm not sure. But I think it's important, at least interesting. And if I go a couple more clicks, suddenly I see this, I call that a constellation. Because that same student, 1064, is in the middle of this huge network. And that's as far as I can go. If I go any further, I get no more data. So that is the entire network from that one student involved with mediations and one-on-ones and interactions with other students who have themselves had other mediations and incidents and so on. So this is a visualization of what was in that uh, relational database. I haven't added anything, but I'm just presenting it in a new form. In addition, the, relational, the graph database, by its very nature of being stored as a graph, allows us to then do uh, some very interesting analytics on the relationships, because that's the core of what the database holds. And that, I think, is where we want to go. So that's a constellation. And if you look into the data, there are a number of those. This one is one of the biggest I found, but there are others as well. And of course, the question here is, what is this telling us? Again, I don't know. It's in the data. And we've now got a tool to pull it out but now we have to look at it and decide, what is it telling us? Is this something that's highlighting there's a certain characteristic pattern in this rela these relationships that might be meaningful to us or not? I don't know. And then we hear some uh, special terms surrounding this kind of stuff, things like AI and ML, machine learning, or artificial intelligence, big data, all these things. Well, yes. Yes, it's out there, it's very important. And the thing is, the analytics that come with this, the analytics that we apply to big data, that help us learn to identify things, like in manufacturing, uh, certain processes, we can, we can teach the machine to watch for things like when a certain combination of factors that, as a human, I may not ever be aware of, but when these combinations come together in a nexus, suddenly we're gonna have a failure in the production line. Or we're gonna have a super fantastic product one that hits the top of the charts on everything. That's what, what uh, machine learning is about. And of course, this comes from having data to work with in a form that supports the analysis. And that's what uh, Graph Database does. It supports this analysis directly. And graph algorithms have been around uh, as long as computers have been around. We understand graphs very well in computer science. And we can take that understanding and apply it to the data analysis without having to go through the complicated uh, hoops that a relational database would require us to do. By doing those analytics, two things come to mind. One is, given a characteristic set of graph pattern, we might be recognizing or seeing something that could lead to something else, because we've seen that pattern before, and that pattern has ended with this. So prediction is a possibility. Now I say it's a possibility, it's not for certain. It's simply saying, I think you should be aware of this. You have to decide whether or not that's the case. But the data is telling us through what we've seen in the past and what we have learned that this is something to be attentive to. Or it might be, you've given me a situation 
In the past, I've seen lots of those situations. This set of situations tend to uh, work out well when this is the follow-up. These, the same situations with this follow-up don't seem, don't work quite as well. So prediction and recommendation are again parts of the system we can then use once we have this data in a form that can be analyzed in such a way. And remember that all of this is to support the facilitator in working with his students or her students so that we get positive outcomes for the people involved. That's, that's the whole purpose. Uh, the, original, the original relational effects produced interesting results, absolutely. The graphs that we have from that data uh, has interesting things in it as well. But under the new approach, we're going to do things like, instead of having independent schools starting it every year, we're going to track students from the beginning of their entry into the RAP program until they leave school. Or they no longer are involved with the RAP program that's where our data is coming from. We're also going to track it across schools. So a student moves from school to school, we'll be able to track that student. Now, are we tracking it with all of their private data? No. We're tracking them in an anonymous way. They will be uh, ID'd. The ID will not be in any way related except at the school to their, their actual ID and given in the analytics we won't, wouldn't be able to follow it, but we can follow that particular ID through the four years. And then the ultimate analysis of the uh, data from all schools collected together, uh, doing the learning and the recommending and the predicting and so on, that'll be on anonymized data, so data that we don't track back or uh, there's no way we can track back to the students. So we're very aware of privacy and the student data and the school's um, policies and their, their, uh, the importance that they put on the, the privacy of the, of the person. We will track as much as we can without violating that privacy, but giving us the, the uh, relationship that we can then find. So if we have a student in grade nine, and by grade 12, they've gone from being a fire starter to w working with, uh, with people themselves and, and getting, getting people to uh, stop fighting and work more positively together. We'll be able to track that and demonstrate it. We might not be able to say that is Cyril Capel who is doing that, but we'll be able to track and say, well, we've got student one, two, three, four, who has gone through these, these changes from the start to the end of their high school career. And this is an important thing. And here are potential, um, potential things that they were involved with that may have affected it. Again, that would be Carolyn who does that final analysis and says, the data is telling me interesting stuff, and I can then say that this is uh, due to that or whatever. So we're trying to make her work uh, better. Now, because I'm a techie kind of person and uh, I work with two other people in a very small room, we call ourselves the three geeks in a closet, and so I'm not going to uh, continue on down that tech road. So this is probably the shortest uh, of the presentations, but it is kind of exciting when you see the pictures and these, these pictures are the visualization of what is in this data that can help us as a roadmap to the future and hopefully it'll be positive and bright for everyone involved. So thank you. Thank you, Cyril. Yes, indeed, uh, a picture's worth a thousand words and perhaps 10,000 data points or some such thing. <laughs> Our next speaker, uh, Arthur Whetstone, uh, has a bachelor's degree in political science and education, his master's in political science, and his doctorate of education. Dr. Whetstone is president of Whetstone Consulting and has 35 years of experience in government, strategic thinking, and performance management in the community college and in you know, the nonprofit you know, sectors. In addition uh, he, to 15 years as a consultant, he has, a college, has been a college president you know, for 18 years. Dr. Whetstone. <laughs> 
Great. Well, thanks Welcome. very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I uh, want to thank the uh, Restorative Action Program to give me an opportunity to work with them. Um, it's uh, really my job now is to summarize. What I'm going to say you've seen or touched on in the previous three presentations. So what I'm doing, what my uh, start of this, it was uh, to uh, uh, really bring together uh, the eight years of research and maybe to add and sort of enhance that. Uh, they mentioned the project one. Well, this is phase three that I'm speaking about. Uh, phase two is the database. This is phase three of a larger project uh, as, we go as they go forward to try and move this. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview, some key terms as we talk. Then I'm going to talk about the logic model. You'll notice a substantive difference in this one because the first one that Karen showed they drew was fairly simple and the program has become equally more complex. And so trying to define that on one page becomes equally challenging. Um, and then show you a bit differences because there are actually three core types of students that are seen by the RAP program. And while the types of outcomes are the same, the outcomes that each one are going to receive will differ in terms of what you can expect the outcomes. And then just very briefly on performance and measuring. So I mentioned it. The key was to define some key terms. Um, to identify the performance indicators, identify data, tools, and then some approaches to re reporting that, basically. So uh, I'm not going to go into all of those. Uh, there were 18 outcomes that we defined. And many of that was actually defined in the project and the document itself around project three. It had eight questions. We were to address those eight qu outcome related questions. The performance indicators are set uh, to uh, indicate each one of those eight outcomes. There are 42 performance indicators. And then there were seven data collection tools that were identified. Uh, things, uh, some from the student, feedback from the student, uh, facilitator feedback as well, like their client notes and their reporting, uh, refers, because their referrals in and re refer feedback as well, um, and some other, uh, other source, uh, some other key, those are the key ones, and so there were seven basic sources. So uh, inputs uh, uh, are the key in the model, uh, logic models, there are sort of some key terms. And so inputs to those are things like the funding and staff, and sometimes it's called resources. Activities and interventions, that's what they do. And uh, Winston spoke about the PRR model, and that outlines the framework of the things they do in the program to achieve the results that they want to achieve. The outputs are the key immediate results. If you're in school, a key output is grades. And this one is some change of behavior of some sort, whether it be conflict or other types of behavior. Uh, and so really that's the evidence that the activity has been performed. And so that's the immediate out output. And then you have outcomes or effects. And this is the changes in individuals, groups, uh, and community or school that are a result of that change of behavior. And so uh, they can be behavioral, relational, attitudinal, or knowledge-based. And uh, the real long-term goal is often you want to start with, though, when you start to outcomes measurement, which is this is about, you want to make sure that the longer term goals are the ones you measure because they're interim goals to get there. And so you'll see where the outcomes are because if you have a change of skills and attitudes, but if you don't have a change of behavior and you ha don't have a change of behavior, that's how effective is it? If you have a change in skills and a change in behavior, but you have no impact on the school and community, then how effective is it? So it really starts there and then you have the intermediate ones as you get there. So when you look at outcomes measurement, you want to make sure you're looking at the longer term objectives. So I know that you can all read this very clearly <laughs> because it's such good print. So we'll try and make it a little larger so it's easier to read. Um, so we, I talked about the inputs and resources. Uh, they're basically the staff, the space, refers out of people, there's self-referrals, but there's other referrals like schools and families, uh, different partners. The PRR model is a resource because it's a framework. And then there's funding and in-kind support. So the activities and presentations, uh, Winston went over this. <clears throat> so uh, to try and capture the breadth and scope in a logic model, which is one page, you have to sort of sometimes group things. And so the PR model became a very effective way of grouping it because it speaks to the types of activities they do to lead to the results. 
and the two key first level outcomes are going to be changes of skills in conflict, leadership, uh, and uh, communications, and change of attributes. And the RAP model uses the development assets model as the base of what you're doing, and so the the types of attributes that you see are really from that developmental assets theory. So we look at the outcomes. <coughs> we get to have the, on the top and the bottom and the yellow boxes you have the uh, developmental uh, skills and you have the attributes. If those are gained, then you're going to have recognizing harm, accepting responsibility and taking action as other three necessary immediate first level outcomes. And then we uh, go into the blue which is the second level because the first level is concentrated within the student itself. It's a student that develops the attitude. It's a student that will gain and learn the skills. And so the next one you go uh, is to the student acting in their environment or interacting with others in their environment. And so that's where you get fewer conflicts, developing, maintaining relationships, undertaking leadership roles, recognizing and expressing needs, and improved mental health and refraining from self-harm. Uh, that's the sort of the second level, and when you start to come measuring, we'll come back to that. And the third level is in the environment itself. Changes of conflict in the school. Changes of conflict within the family, improved family relationships, improved relationships in the school, uh, reduced interaction with the justice system, are environmental changes. So when you're developing, often when you'll see a logic model, you'll see a time frame, and they'll say short term, intermediate term, and long term. And that's true, and one of the challenges in creating this was that this is not a linear model. It's a dynamic model. They learn skills and attributes, they use them, which leads to a change of behavior, which leads to some out results in the outcome. As they gain that, then they come back, they learn new attributes, new skills, and you have more change of behavior, which has more out different outcomes. So it's a very dynamic model, and it leads to some challenges about how do you show the growth. One of the values of the new databases, Cyril talked about, is some very really challenging, measuring outcomes can be a challenge. This allows the collection of data, but it'll start to allow them to create uh, scenarios and without a lot of extra work just from the data input around each of the individual students, to now to indicate around changes of attitude, changes of uh, numbers of conflicts, uh, changes of recognizing him, so all of those can start to be built within the database and you can start to actually generate reports out of it. Because the difference between what uh, an outcomes measurement system that has regular reporting is that it it's happens all the time. But the biggest challenge is that this takes time and resources. And time and resources cost because you put m funds and resources into the outcome measurement and outcomes reporting, or do you put it in providing services? So it's a major challenge. But that, those become the key pieces of the output. Uh, and I, that, this one is really the full meal deal. So when we identified the students, we identified three. Restorative, conflict, and dispute. Restorative students are those that have severe conflicts, and are coming because of seri uh, con severe conflicts, uh, 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 challenges with the uh, interaction with the justice system, other major issues. And so this is sort of the full meal deal. This is what you'd expect that there'd be at least a significant part of those from those students. They're around longer. They're there for two, one, two, three years, and sometimes all four years they're, they're involved with the RAP, RAP program for different reasons in different relationship, but they're often involved, so that's what you get. But the conflict students are very different. They're going to have a few small amounts of those because these are students that have conflict situations. In Cyril's model, they'll have two or three of those nodes around the conflicts. 
And so they're there for a shorter period of time to learn to manage conflict. And so they may have two, three, and four sessions, and then that's it. They're gone. They're out of the program. They have been successful in one way or another, or they just left, but they're not out of, into the program any long term. So the outcomes you can expect are much more limited. They can be, they'll have some skills, and they should, sh you can expect, because there will be some counseling involved, the recognition of harm and empathy. You can expect then the use of those, and then you can uh, in see the involvement in lesser, lesser conflicts, fewer conflicts, which leads to fewer conflicts in the school, and perhaps better family relationships and better peer relationships. The third student is the dispute student. These students are there for one conflict, they have one session, and that's it. The dispute is they, that dispute has resolved, and that's it. That's their interaction with RAP. So you can see that this is even going to be less. So if you apply and try and include these students when you're using the full model to measure outputs, you're going to have a very low rate. So you have to treat and you measure your outcomes based upon the three different types of students. There's many other variables, but these are three core ones. Now you'll see that there's developed skills. It's questionable whether they may or may not identify some sort of recognition of harm. Mm, it's, uh, it's uncertain. Uh, they will use uh, the conflict resolution. They will have applied it once, whether they learn it long term. And then they, they resolve, and questionable what the impact. We know that there may be one conflict or two, but if they don't go back, it may be the, the reduction of future conflicts that are there. So when you take and try and report this, and try to a reporting system so you can say, how do we report on outcomes? You have three both sort of very common approaches. The one on the end is special studies. That's what they've been doing with Carolyn. They've been doing special studies and doing work and uh, ongoing basis, and they do vary, but it's basically special studies and reports. On a consistent basis, the activity and output report is often done on a monthly basis, sometimes quarterly, but often monthly. It's the things that, that uh, um, Winston showed you. Number of activities, number of participants, number of students in, number of students out, the number of workshops, the number of participants and workshops. That's the type of thing. A quarterly report is the same stuff, reporting typically, inputs, outputs, but often they'll add some richer data, demographics, grades of students, some other demographic information. Uh, they might be a little more in or out, you know, the types of sources and uh, bullying and that. A little bit more richer information. The difference between just a strict report and the quarterly is a quarterly looks at hindsight, what happened, and they want to give what we can we expect in the next quarter or the next trimester. The other thing is it's usually comparative. How does this compare to last year? How does it compare to the plan we had? If you had a plan to have 10 workshops, did you have 10 workshops with 100 participants? So it's always comparative, and it has a backward and forward look if it's a good report. The final one is a quarter, as an outcomes report. That is typically done on an annual basis. It's going to speak to the outcomes. Oops that we have, oops, one more, that we have on the far term and perhaps the medium. So the student interaction and certainly the far one. Now you may do outcomes measurements on things like attributes. There's some skill, like there's some certain uh, standardized uh, surveys they can do that they can get a measure of those. They can do maybe skills. Now the ideal way is if you have a good high intake, you do a pre, a, a, an intake assessment of those and you do an output, but and the RAP program, that's really not feasible. So you may be in, maybe some interim and some output measurements in terms of attributes, but you really want to know what's the impact on the school, what's the impact on the students' grades and participation in the school, their attachment to the school, their citizenship, and how are they feeling with the family, and what's their interaction with the justice system. If you know that, then you can start to work back using some of the data to try and understand the question Cyril said is, why? Did our program have the effect? So you start there and say, that's the impact we're having on our community, and here's why we think it's us and not some other variable that's at, in, acting in the environment. 
And so just as an example, this is a sample of conflict, which is one of the outcomes. So you look at the student, the, the, the dispute student, so it's dis dispute resolved, they don't repeat, and the number of uh, referrers that are satisfied. So you get feedback from referrers and you need that. The sample of the for the conflict students is very similar, uh, but when you get into the restorative student, uh, you're going to have some very similar ones, uh, no conflicts in months, number of conflicts, and the average change with category. So it's a little richer data because you have more to work with. Uh, so that's with conflict, which is common across all three students. Another sample which doesn't involve the uh, dispute students is the change in conflict in the in school situation. Uh, perception of safety now comes in, in terms of this. Is there a change of perception of safety in the school because of the reduced conflict? And so you get similar stuff, uh, higher engagement in the school, the tens and grades, improved attendance, uh, perception of safety in that. So you get a richer and more extensive one as you take a look at the three different students. That's why it's very important to always, you have to know what this type of student you're dealing with so you can do the outcomes. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>
When I transferred back to Mount Royal, I received support for the RAP program in many fashions. And I was thankful for the RAP facilitators Megan Mitchell and Teresa Vakalik during my high school years. In my final year, Shauna transferred back to Mount Royal and our relationship was different than I was, it was in grade nine. She had a larger impact in my life and I was thankful for to show that Shauna was there to watch me graduate. The perseverance, support, and assistance that Shauna, Megan, and Teresa bestowed on me taught me life skills that I continue to use forever and forgave and grateful for. Rap taught me how to use words and assertiveness instead of actions and aggression. I learned how to use my influence and my power to positive means and to believe in myself. I work hard to be a leader in my school and my community by pushing people around me to do their best. I encourage my peers to stay in school and to get their education so they don't go through the same mistakes that I did, repeating grades or dropping out or causing necessary conflict. I've turned out to be the leader that everyone told me I would be and that I often didn't accept that I could be. I am now using my leadership skills to put others and myself to do positive things. Throughout my high school, I have learned that you may want something and you have to work hard to achieve it. The only person that can make you do anything is you. I've learned to focus on myself and my future to help me achieve things instead of dwelling on my past and my mistakes. I've made the, the, the commitment to stay focused on myself and my positive ch life choices rather than conceding to peer pressure and getting into trouble. I know that I have a lot of to, to balance in my responsibilities. My future goals are now to pursue a career in supporting others. I want to own my own house and I plan to get married to my high school sweetheart. I want to have a family and I want to travel places around the world and help others. Once again, I'm really thankful to the Restorative Action Program and RAP facilitators for never giving up on me and for teaching me that I had the power to achieve success. Thank you for attending tonight. Winston, you'll be uh, uh, certain uh, you'll pass on our thanks very much to Danielle for that, uh, you know, wonderful insight, you know, from a, a consumer's perspective that uh, really speaks to the heart of, of what uh, I think RAP is, is all about. A couple of things before we, we move on. We'd like to open things up um, momentarily um, and to the audience and for a, a panel discussion uh, from our, our presenters. I should also, and I didn't do this at the outset, you know, you know thanks and, and welcome those who are viewing the, uh, the live feed um, across the country and, and beyond, and uh, point out that um, you know, you know, this, the, the file will be saved and archived on the uh, Forensic Center you know, website in, in a few days, as well as uh, some of the reports that have been, been uh, cited over the last hour or so uh, are also uh, viewable, uh, located you know, on the Forensic Center U of S you know, website. It's pretty easy you know, to find. I should also um, uh, make a couple of thanks. One uh, to the Correctional Service of Canada for uh, its contribution, uh, annual contribution to support you know, the uh, public forum uh, that, that we conduct each year. And also to you know, the College of uh, Law which uh, you know, pr makes a, a contribution so that we're able to uh, you know, cast this um, uh, on a website and make it more widely uh, available. Um, oh, yes, and also um, uh, our colleagues in the College of Law pointed out, and this is partly why we're meeting this week, uh, this is, uh, across the country, um, Access to Justice Week. And um, it's a concept that um, uh, colleges of law across the country, and in fact, you know, bar associations uh, across the country, I mean, promote annually. Uh, access to justice is an important concept that our brethren in, in the legal promotion uh, profession uh, are working hard you know, to promote. And I dare say, in a small way, um, the restorative action program is I mean, perhaps a little different uh, uh, perspective on uh, you know, justice, but uh, one that is, is important and you know, access in a, in a more, uh, let's say, informal means 
than we find through you know, the you know, traditional you know, justice system. It also occurs to me that um, you know, people may wonder you know, why the, the forensic center um, you know, is, is sponsoring this particular e event. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to point out that indeed, uh, certainly we're interested in uh, you know, justice and crime prevention, you know, but crime prevention in, in many different ways. Um, and so things like you know, the restorative action program you know, with its um, sort of restorative justice and its uh, social justice you know, perspective you know, to improving you know, the lot of uh, all of us in the, in the community is uh, an important initiative. And so we get out of our traditional forensic uh, perspective and, and look a bit beyond uh, the, you know, the formal justice system. Um, you know, so I appreciate you mean, what the folks in, um, in the RAP are, are doing in, in Saskatoon. Uh, particularly at, at the high school level, um, you know, it, it's so vital. I mean, those are, are uh, such critical years in uh, all of our you know, personal developments, you know, the, in in the, the life cycle. I, I'm reminded in the, the U.S. Uh, there's a term that's become popular, sadly popular. Um, it's a phrase, you know, that called you know the school to prison pipeline, and man, what a, a metaphor, what a, a sad commentary on you know the education uh, education system as it's formally you know, uh, evolved in that country, and, and I dare dare say, uh, you know, this country. Uh, certainly, uh, to extend that that metaphor, and I would suggest that. Um, that RAP you know, somehow you know, digs into that pipeline, or maybe at the front of that pipeline, reroutes, you know, maybe they're not building a, um, the Trans Mountain Pipeline you know, to British Columbia, but are developing another kind of pipeline out of you know, the formal justice system and into you know, various kinds of, of resolutions that are much more um, you know, palatable and, and appreciated. So with that little sort of foray, I'd like to uh, open things up. If any of the uh, panel members uh, wish to comment, either amongst themselves or um, the brilliant metaphor that's just been uh, you know, laid out on the table, I mean, you're welcome to, you know, to do so. Uh, similarly, you know, we have uh, mics and we encourage folks you know, from the audience uh, to pose questions or, or reflections. And also... Carolyn. I was going to say also for our viewers at home, uh, I have my bit of technology with me. If you do have any questions, please feel free to email them. I'll get them and we'll address them up here. Any takers? Comments? Oh, here, okay. <coughs> Hi, thank you all for your talks tonight. They're very interesting. Uh, one question I have um, is, so RAPS obviously had a very extensive history of evaluation over its uh, duration. I'm curious what recommendations or advice you would have to other organizations who are also interested in engaging in evaluation and in making evaluation a priority. Very good question. And yeah, I want to emphasize again just how uh, remarkable what has what is happening around rap is for anyone who doesn't necessarily have that context to understand the the idea that we have uh, a graph database instead of boxes of paper forms that have been filled out and never entered even into an Excel spreadsheet to be analyzed which is probably industry standard <laughs> for nonprofit data collection <laughs> is it, like it, it's it's hard to wrap uh, your mind around so that's, that is a question. I work with lots of other organizations, and I certainly would love to see every single one of them uh, get to have the kind of opportunities and growth that RAP has had. I think from a evaluator perspective, one of the most important principles we followed was to, to start small. 
I think we did start from very humble beginnings. The idea was not that we, when we started in 2011, we did not envision landing here exactly, but there was that idea of like, okay, well, if we just, just do this to start, and then we'll see what else we can do, and then we'll see what else we can do. And RAP has been a very creative and resourceful organization looking for different sources of funding uh, to support the different projects. I mean, it's definitely an exercise in patience and, and perseverance. Um, but one of the biggest things, I think, for an organization, I'll be interested to get Winston's take on this, is um, having that interest and passion and commitment because it on all levels from from you know the the board all the way down to the frontline staff um, everyone had to be on board with the idea that this is worth fighting for that this is something that matters that this helps us do what we want to do and i think that's what kept it moving forward over the years i think carolyn uh, sums up very nicely in her initial comments about the question we had is it working <laughs> Like, is it really working? We, we wanted to understand that very wholeheartedly. You know, you can always kind of um, have the pleasure at organization of smiling at yourself and saying, we're doing good work. But understanding what that work is and understanding what the impact of that work was for us and is for us is it was a very, very important measure. And I, you know, want to really thank the board of directors, the organization, and staff for coming towards that. I remember when we had our very first evaluability study that came out from the university and we, we gave that to the board, people were like, where are the outcomes? <laughs> and Carolyn was very much like, oh, that's years from now. <laughs> and the board kind of did the, we paid how much for this? <laughs> but still committed, still committed to the idea of, of doing it because they recognized the value and you can hear the years we've committed to. Um, and Jack and Julie Shirley Broski were some of the incredible supporters at that time who helped us to get some funding uh, to continue some of that work and had that contingency that if we ever had short years, we could actually uh, continue the re research. We did not want to lose that. And that's been something that we have put a lot of resources financially towards. But at the end of the day, we have been able to have a deeper understanding and more of an appreciation as to what we're doing. Now we have some incredible partners. SAS Poly, and we've also had incredible partners in U of S for sure, in the President's Center, but also we have a consultant like Arthur who has given us even more glimpses in. So we at one point cracked the door open a little bit, and then we opened the door a little bit more. Now we have a garage door we're looking into, which is actually a great perspective to have. And we're now seeing and understanding things, and now we'll one day we'll be inside the house, I think. So we'll be really, we're in good shape and really um, enthusiastic to see where this leads, but for us, it's been a very, very important journey and one that we would never go back and ever not do. That's if really I could amazing. Just add, uh, the starting small uh, commitment of the organization and the third piece, which they did really as the first step, which is absolutely essential, is the logic model. Not because it's the logic model, because it took, uh, if there's 100 people in the organization, it took the 100 different views of what they do and what the outcomes are and gave them one view. And that is an essential first step to be able to doing evaluation or whatever you want, any type form of performance monitoring, to having a, an agreed upon set of uh, outputs, activities, and outcomes. And actually, if I can add to that as well, one of the interesting things to, to see, as the logic model evolved, it did so because the conversations were evolving. Mm -hmm. Just the very process of starting to ask those questions like, well, what do you mean by leadership? you know, in 2011 produces an answer in 2018, but it takes a lot of iterations of conversations of people mm -hmm. thinking about that question, having that, uh, co those conversations go on between the staff, go on at board meetings, go on um, in discussions with, with other stakeholders and funders and partners to start to arrive at those answers. Thank you. I have more questions. I oh, please. Keep asking. Um, so I have two more questions, I guess. One is, um, I was really impressed by the list of benefactors and supporters that RAP had. How did RAP gain that much support? Um, I know that's an issue that many organizations struggle yeah. with, and I'm curious how RAP has been so successful. What have been your secrets to success? Well, first and foremost, we are incredibly thankful to those benefactors and supporters, and they come from friends of RAP, people who gave 100 bucks 
people who gave, you know, 500 bucks. Um, and they go right up to governmental supporters. You know, the government of Saskatchewan, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Justice, you know, who are incredible supporters in that regard. The two school divisions who contribute financially to the program also. Um, you know, to Dakota Dunes, to, you know, Trinity Credit Union, to all these individuals and organizations that have contributed towards our program. Those are very important. And I think one of the things that really helped to gain that level of support is the research. That to me has been a very, very important thing. People also want to know, is it working? You know, and, and what is the value of this? If we're going to give $80,000 to the Ministry of Justice or Ministry of Education, we want to know what that impact actually looks like and how it actually can be conveyed. And so part of our commitment to also get this information too was to be able to ensure funders that they were putting that money towards the program in a very, very conscious and, 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 and prescribed way. Um, but you're right. A lot of organizations f struggle with those levels of support. We've been extremely fortunate with that, uh, but that the beginning of that commitment was Rotarians. They were the ones who actually went into the community and started to galvanize the sponsors and the stakeholders together, started to communicate with people who maybe didn't know about rap. You know, I'm sure many of you may have, may or may not have heard, but uh, on, the, on the radio, for example, um, the uh, Sasu Media Group, they do PSAs, public service announcements, where, you know, they are running in prime time that talks about rap in, as perspective of the, the student and, how, and why you should have it or why, why it's there for you or how you can access it and so on, to, to parents to get to know about what's going on there. So there's lots of these individuals and organizations that have stepped forward to really say that this is ours. And I think that's also the key. This is not a top-down program. It's never been that way. It's always been from the grassroots. It's been driven by now the organization of the sort of action program um, to make sure that the community has it. But at the end of the day, I think what's really been very indicative in this whole journey is people say, this is for me. And I say, you know, rap is for my kids. You know, I, I have a child in a rap school who one day came with, came with a problem. And I could have solved it, but I thought to myself, you know what? You have a wonderful rap facility at your school. <laughs> Why don't you go there tomorrow morning and see him and talk about this issue, right? And then my child came home and told me all of these things that I've been saying to her for so many years. And I said, oh, really? Interesting that they would say that. I just wonder where they've gotten that information. Great. But the message was heard. So it's those kind of results where people like myself, who are not just a, I guess, a um, supporter and developer, but also a client, a receiver. A beneficiary, a beneficiary of it, you know. So is that's really important to see that. But I think more than anything else, we're very thankful to our supporters. Great, thank you. Let's go over the other mic and then possibly come back. Uh, oh. I first want to just, uh, as an outside observer, I want to thank you for this uh, devotion to the work of of seeking solutions to what. You, it's, you guys are in, working in the front line trenches of what uh, can amount to a war when it's lost. I, uh, I have a nephew who's 14 and he's incarcerated right now in Kilbourne uh, for various bad behavior over the summer. Uh, so I can see that uh, the work you do is essential. And I tell this nephew that the, the, the only evaluation that'll count in the long term is his own self-evaluation that he gives himself when he's in the adult realm in 2025 and beyond. When he will be uh, forgiven all this incredibly bad behavior if he gives himself the self-evaluation that he's, he's established a good home and a good family, that he's a good, a good partner, good life partner to his spouse, and that he's delivering his talents and gifts to the world with gainful employment. Uh, and that's in a very long-term evaluation that only he can do for himself. Uh, in the short term, in the context of the institution of high schools and dealing with what amounts to disruptive behavior, 
in the institution of uh, high school, uh, I think that's what you're dealing with mostly with rap, is trying to create a better atmosphere in the schools in the context of schooling and getting them through the high school problems. I just hope that there would be an additional, I think there is, there was some mention of being responsible community members and community service, which was a great aspect of, uh, of your programs. I just hope that it's included, that they could be given a formula, a formula where they would, presented, they would be presented with themselves as young adult, uh, giving themselves their own self-evaluation in the future. And hopefully that would contribute to giving them a long-range vision of what the prize is to get their eye on a, a prize at the end where they're uh, a good parent and a, and a good partner and a good provider, paying their bills and keeping a good, safe, secure home. And that vision of being a responsible community citizen member who gives back to their community too in the long run. Uh, so I appreciate your work because I can see I can see what happens when uh, kids fall through the cracks, and his situation is particularly dire. He's, he's fallen victim to predatory gang member activity in the city, which it's kind of new to me, this whole perspective on, on what youth are facing inside and, and outside of the school system, and so I, you, there's not many people here tonight to appreciate, but I certainly, uh, I think, represent a large population that appreciates the, the benefits of your, of your actions and your devotions. And I just want to thank you. Thank you. Hi, one last question from me. Um, I'm now curious in where does RAP go from here? What are your future evaluation plans and goals? And any thoughts on that? Uh, from, from the technology perspective, we're going to look at more uh, ways that we can engage the students directly. Uh, there are technologies today that just weren't around seven years ago, so we can use them now, things like uh, an, a, a rap app, I call it, that we could put on a student phone that can interact with them at their choice. They may say, I really had fun today. When, uh, when asked, you know, did you have a good day? I really had fun today. Or I'm, I'm responding to a question that the facilitator asked me later because I didn't have time then. I'd rush off to class or whatever. So there, there's uh, engagement that we can take uh, with the student through an, uh, an app on their phone at their choice, their choice to interact, and their choice to, and I, I think with the, with the uh, generation in high school now and the technologies they have, engagement with, with uh, the technology is something they do, and we can leverage that and then capture that data and using it as well as everything else we know to move the, the RAP program forward and increase the positive outcomes. Sure. Um, I'm curious how RAP has changed over the last several years in terms of sort of the, the, maybe the type of students they've seen or the reasons for referral or the resources that are being sort of required. I think um, initially when the program was, was formulated, the area really was focusing on kids at risk or identified to be at risk. When I became involved with the program, one of the things I kind of um, stated was, all kids are at risk. And I remember the discussion I had at the time was, well, yeah, we know that. There's certain kids at risk. So, no, all of them. And I remember having this little back and forth and you know, kind of a jovial, kind of joking way of saying, all kids could be at risk. And what I meant by that was that if we think to our own lives, our own upbringing and growth and so on, we all did very stupid things. And we all did things that potentially could put us at risk. And for some times, for some people, what made the difference was a caring, competent adult. Not often their peers, but somebody who knew how to get them out or helped them to be supported with that. 
So that conceptual framework and then the addition of the PIR model really kind of started to look at a way of approaching all kids, not just a segment of the population. And I think it's one of the things that, that we've learned over the years is meeting kids where they're at, giving them an opportunity to be exposed to, to RAP, either as a leadership activity, a prevention activity, an intervention, or one-on-one, a -on -one, restorative justice uh, repairing of the harm, a connection back into school after suspension. Whatever young person needs, the great thing about the framework is that it meets them. It doesn't say, well, we're only about raising awareness, or we're really about dealing with the problems, or we're really about, you know, these kids that right now, they're just totally, just they're off the track. It's really a continuum of service. It's a layer of support in school. And in conjunction with our school uh, partners, it's really become um, a, a very, very contributing factor to the school. Now, what I'm very pleased about and very impressed about, when I go into a lot of our schools and talk with our staff and our, our individuals and so on and so forth, they don't just say the rap is them. They start talking about the fact that rap is a school. That really the ideas and the, and the, the principles of rap are pervasive in so many different parts of the school community. So we're seeing our work kind of um, have a little more of a ripple effect, where it's not just that individual, but it becomes a rap school. So now if you go into a rap school, you'll see a sign that's at the front of the school building that says, proud to be a rap school. And I think that, to me, is a real clear indication that it's not just about us anymore, but it's really about the way in which the system operates. And we're back on this side, one more question. Have you guys thought about replication of this program in different cities and provinces across Canada, maybe even internationally? <laughs> 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 there is actually one site in Airdrie. Alberta, yeah. Airdrie, yeah. Alberta. Um, although I don't, we, it's never been within the scope of, of, of my evaluation projects. We focused on the Saskatoon schools, so I can't speak too much to what that's been like, but I know that's been in. Yeah. Major General Lewis McKenzie came to our city a number of years ago, and he's the gentleman that um, ran the uh, bosnia herzegovina response in the United Nations. And he was here um, doing some speeches and presentations. He was actually was our keynote speaker for the Bad Shield and Star, which is an annual dinner that we host in honor of the police, fire, and ambulance services, and recognize women and men of that service, but also, more importantly, the people who've contributed to those services also. I had a great pleasure of being able to shuttle him around to from place to place at different times. And I was driving with him on, on uh, Idlewild. And the train passes there, as we all know, right? And I was stuck behind the train with him. And uh, he was sitting in the car and started asking me more about the rap. I said, you know, I, this is a great thing, Winston. I, I think this is absolutely wonderful that you guys are doing this incredible work with your schools and in the community. And he asked the question you just asked, which was, so where do you think it's going to end up? Like, where is going to be the, the end point of rap? I said, well, simple, Lou, world domination. <laughs> and Mr. McKenzie looked at me straight faced and said, as a military man, I've heard those words a lot over my career, but I think you might do it. <laughs> so definitely I think there's an opportunity to uh, meet the needs, but it's going to have to be um, a very, very, very carefully planned and uh, most importantly managed process. Um, I think we're always open to seeing if there is an opportunity to, to do this work in other places. I think now that we have um, the SAS Poly and their database system. Now we have, I think, what often is missing in a lot of programs, which is the evaluation piece, and the higher level evaluation piece. We have the programming. That's, that's really well documented and well um, researched by Carolyn. You know, now we have the next phase, and now we have, of course, a third phase. So I think all of this together, I think for many communities could be something of interest. Um, I'm interested in seeing where it can be, and I know our board director has been speaking about this and talking about this and, and seeing where we maybe could be of service. I know within the province here, the province of Saskatchewan is always saying, well, you know, this is only Saskatoon right now, but we want to be able to see for other communities that might be helpful. And we don't know the answer to that. We don't know a way of doing that yet. We're still exploring that. Um, but I think as time goes on, we'll maybe start figuring that out. I think RAP is really on, like, the cusp of transformation right now. It's, it's I mean, even the, like, the database solution that we had for the, you know, five or six years was, it was not scalable. 
Uh, like, I, I mean, I think sort of serial summed some of the limitations of that database. It was always meant to be like a, can we capture this kind of data? But it was also, like it was a cyborg database. It was half me um, holding that thing together. Um, and at that point, like you can't add more schools onto that and still be doing that at the same time. So the fact that we're now at a point where um, we can look deeper into the data than we ever had before, we'll have more flexibility than we've ever had before, um, it frees me up to start looking more into the why and less into the, you know, what are the, you know, what are mm -hmm. all these what's, all these questions, but start looking into some of the answers. Um, yeah, that, that where we're at, at right now is a big turning point, I think, in terms of the last seven years. And it's exciting to think about what could potentially come next. And scary. And scary. <laughs> And that's a great question, I think, uh, you know, to, to end on this evening. Uh, I'd like particularly to thank uh, our four speakers you know, this oh, evening right, for you know, such an informative and, I dare say, uh, energizing you know, set of presentations. I, I feel the enthusiasm around the, the room and, you know, as was illustrated in, in that last question, you know, what, what can others do? Um, and that makes me wonder, uh, those of you who might be in Winnipeg or Thunder Bay or Quebec City or St. John's, Newfoundland, you know, if, if you're interested in starting your own rap program, well, by gosh, just call Winston. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I only say that uh, half jokingly. Anybody who is interested in more information certainly can get in touch with Winston and any of the panelists, you know, through the Forensic Center website and will be and glad you know, to link you, and indeed, if you are interested in developing something comparable in your own um, jurisdiction, agency, I mean, city, um, I'm, we're all you know, willing to help out in whatever way we can. Thanks very much, panel, and um, we'll see everybody in a year from now. Thanks very much. <laughs>